just give people time to sign in. All right, it is 1131. I want to welcome all of you today. You are joining the weekly seminar of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. As you know, America votes in 26 days amidst a pandemic and some of some rattling events uh, across the nation's history over the past few months as we've all been sitting in our houses including some of the largest public protests over racial injustice over the summer and big debates about the stimulus package that the government ought to provide or not. Today to talk about some of those policy questions that we're facing in the election, we have Lan He Chen joining us as the Diane and David Steffi Fellow in American Public Policy Studies at the Hoover Institute. He's Director of Domestic Policy Studies and a lecturer in public policy programs at Stanford University and has worked on four presidential campaigns he was the policy director of the Romney Ryan campaign in 2012. And in 2014 and 2018, he was a senior advisor on policy to the National Republican Senatorial Committee, or NRSC. Today, he will be discussing public policy in the 2020 elections for about 30 minutes, during which time, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A, and we will make sure to devote enough time to have a robust discussion of some of what he discusses today. All right, so thank you, Lanny. Uh, thanks, Dee Dee, and thank you um, to CDDRL and uh, to the audience today. I wish we could all be together in person, obviously, but uh, but circumstances don't allow for that. So uh, we'll make the best of our time as possible. Um, I'm going to be spending some time talking about where we are in the 2020 election cycle, talking a little bit about some of the policy contrasts. Um, you know, Dee Dee and I were just talking about how little policy has made its way into the conversation. Uh, I think, sadly, that's a secular trend that we're seeing in U.S. presidential campaigns where there's less and less focus on policy. Um, I thought there was a little bit of policy conversation in last night's vice presidential debate, if you happen to have an opportunity to see that between uh, Vice President Pence and Senator Harris. Uh, you know, I think there were some interesting issues raised, and we'll spend some time talking about those contrasts. But um, what I want to do, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have some slides I'd like to walk through. Um, that sort of do a few things. So first of all, I would like to, to spend some time thinking about where we are in the election cycle right now. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, where we are in the election cycle right now, uh, talking a little bit about what some of the key policy contrasts are and maybe what we would anticipate seeing uh, in a Biden-Harris administration uh, and then a second a Trump administration if there is one. Uh, and then uh, Dee Dee will lead us in a, in a moderated Q&A, which I look forward to as well. Um, the electoral landscape this year, I think, is, uh, is an interesting one in part because it's multifaceted. Uh, yet in some ways, all, all of these issues you see here are, are tied together. Um, we're obviously dealing with the challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has become, I think, the big overlay for this election and has fundamentally altered the trajectory of the president's possibility of re-election. Uh, I, I think if we had this conversation in January or February, it would have sounded and looked very different, obviously, than it has today. But you match uh, that with some of what we've seen with respect to the reckoning that's happening in, in our country with respect to, um, to racial injustice and some of those issues that were surfaced by Black Lives Matter protests, protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, uh, and other incidents which have shocked our nat national conscience in a lot of ways, those also feed very much into the electoral context. Um, the U.S. economy has seen a tremendous roller coaster uh, over the last several months, having one of the, in fact, the worst quarter on record, and then now looking to have probably the best quarter on record. Um, all of that kind of precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic and related shutdowns, and that has had a significant impact on the election. Uh, most will tell you that the economy is one of the, if not the predominant issue on which U.S. elections have tended to be decided. And I think this year the economy is clearly a large factor, but it is tied in with all the rest of these things that 
uh, that we'll talk about. And then finally, the US-China relationship, which is central to the economic narrative, but also, frankly, a big issue on which both candidates have tried to look tough. I think both candidates have tried to appear as though they uh, will take the better line toward the future of us china relations. And I think uh, that continues to be a, a very contested issue. Um, with respect to, to COVID-19, you know, I don't have to spend too much time belaboring the point here, but obviously it continues to be a public health, economic and social crisis. Uh, and you see in particular, uh, recently, there's been some case growth in states that are considered to be key battleground states in this year's election. There's been a lot of reporting, for example, out of the state of Wisconsin recently, uh, that COVID-19 and cases of COVID-19 have continued to grow uh, there and be part of the, the narrative. Uh, on this question of who would do a better job handling the, the coronavirus, uh, Joe Biden has traditionally performed better and, and up to the, to the recent polling we've seen over the last few days, um, he frankly is, is, uh, is outperforming the president in a, in a very significant way. Uh, and I think to the extent that COVID-19 continues to be a topic, continues to be part of the narrative and conversation, uh, it's something that the Biden-Harris ticket believe that they are working from a position of strength on. Uh, and that's why I think you will continue to see them assail the president's response, the administration's response, and, and it continues to be an issue that is front and center uh, of our everyday lives. I mean, look at what we're what we're living through now here, doing this all remotely. Uh, what we've also seen, obviously, is a a significant issue with respect to what's happening with racial inequality and racial injustice in the United States. Um, this graphic looks at the perceptions of the relationship between white and black Americans. And as you, as you can see, it's actually uh, gotten quite a bit worse over the last few years. And this issue appears on our television screens. It appears in, in, our, in our everyday lives. And, and many amongst us have to live it on a daily basis. Um, it's a very painful thing for many Americans. And I think it is clearly an issue of great salience in the election. Uh, and here too, the vice president, former vice president Joe Biden has seen a political advantage. This is an issue on which there is a perception that he would handle better, that he would handle it with greater empathy. Uh, and that's something that, that I think has, has also had an impact on the election as we see it in the electoral cycle. Uh, the economy is also something where, uh, as I noted earlier, you see on the left, this is a, a, a chart of the U3 or US unemployment rate. Uh, and, and we saw historic highs in unemployment. And you know, now we're kind of coming back off of that. You know, The more significant question in my mind is what's happening again in some of these key swing states. And you will see that in particular in a state like Pennsylvania, which is pretty important to the president's reelection campaign, uh, the unemployment rate remains high. The, the state with the highest unemployment rate is Nevada. And that is a state which, which I think is, is also in play this fall. Uh, and, and the economic contraction, the recovery from the economic contraction, those are issues that I think continue to be of, of significant importance. I, I will say this, I think the president uh, has a natural advantage on the economy. I think voters are inclined to give him the benefit of the doubt, notwithstanding what we've seen with respect to the economic contraction and the recovery we've seen since then. Um, and, and I think that the president tends to benefit when the issue is the economy. Uh, that hasn't always been the issue. That hasn't been the issue his campaign has even been talking about necessarily. And so as a result, I think, I think the president does have, uh, uh, does have a situation where when he's not talking about the economy, I think, I think he's in very challenging terrain. Uh, but when he does talk about the economy, when he is speaking to these economic questions, uh, he is speaking from, from a place of strength. And I would fully expect the Trump uh, Pence ticket to, to try and focus on those issues here in the last uh, 20 some odd days in the close until we approach election day on November the 3rd. And then finally, US China. Um, look, I think it's pretty clear that the American public has exceedingly negative views of China. And we're seeing that. This is research from the Pew Research Center on the left, uh, on my left, which charts the, uh, uh, the favorability and unfavorability of China. And as you can see, it's, it's really kind of gone to historic lows over the course of the last several months. Um, the reasons why I think are, are pretty apparent, whether it's the US economic uh, rivalry with China, whether it's what's happened in Hong Kong with the passage of the national security law and, and the imposition of um, of greater influence on, on Hong Kong, some of the challenges we've seen around Taiwan uh, and, uh, and the handling of COVID-19, human rights issues in, uh, in, in Xinjiang, those have also been front and center. 
All of these things, I think, have participated in creating a much more negative frame around U.S.-China relations. This is an issue on which the two candidates, I, I don't have the data here, but I've looked at it recently, are, are actually very close in terms of public perceptions of who would do a better job. Vice President Biden is slightly favored by more Americans on this. But this is an issue on which President Trump also gets some credit and, and gets relatively high marks in the context of, uh, of what is a very complicated geopolitical issue. Uh, I think Americans see it as uh, the single greatest geopolitical challenge, rightly so, that we will face in the coming decade. And as a result, it, it is an important political issue. But, but the, the thing I'll just say last about this is there is a significant amount of bipartisan dislike for China. And that's why I think you see candidates on both sides of the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats, are trying to seize on China as a campaign issue. And, and I would fully expect that rhetoric and that dialogue to continue as we move ahead. Um, let me just say a few brief words about, about where we stand in the election cycle. Um, and, and I won't spend too much time belaboring this point because I do want to get to the policy. But, you know, I hear a lot in the dialogue that, well, you know, notwithstanding what we see in the public polling or what the dialogue is, uh, you know, remember 2016, right? 2016 was a cycle where purportedly the poll said one thing and things went another and President Trump was able to win. Um, I, I, I would just remind everyone, you know, 2016 and 2020 are, are very different races from a landscape perspective. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, you have an incumbent in 2020. And overwhelmingly, presidential elections are, are in my view, a, um, a retrospective on the incumbent. They are an effort to assess the success of the incumbent. And that changes the dynamic of this race. President Trump's record is very much on trial in this election. And you know, in 2016, you had a you know, two candidates, neither of whom was the incumbent. I guess you could say Hillary Clinton represented the continuation of the Obama years, but I don't think people necessarily saw it that way. Um, and, and so that election was really an election about two challengers trying to seek the presidency. This year, you have a clear incumbent, you have a clear challenger, and that changes the dynamic of the race to the extent that this is a retrospective view of the Trump presidency. Uh, I think it creates an extra set of challenges for President Trump. Beyond that, in 2016, you had two relatively unfavorable candidates running for office. You had two candidates whose images, as we say in, in politics, were upside down. Um, you can see that on the left. Uh, if you look at uh, Trump's rating and Clinton's rating with respect to net favorability, you'll see both Clinton and Trump were historically unpopular candidates. Clinton went into the race at a 13-point deficit net and Trump went in with a net 21% deficit. And I think a lot of voters sort of threw their hands up and, and said, look, you know, they're both unpopular. Why don't I pick the guy who, you know, who's saying he's gonna shake things up? And I think that worked to President Trump's advantage in that election. In 2020, it's a different story. Um, you know, Vice President Biden is not exceedingly popular, but he's actually above water. And he's much more popular on net than, than uh, President Trump is. And favorability ratings tend to represent a little bit of a, of a microcosm of what's happening in the electoral cycle. Uh, and, and here we see a situation where, uh, where Joe Biden is, is still more popular. And I think that will benefit him. I, I, I think it is clearly an opportunity for him to pick up support of undecided voters. Uh, and, and I think it shifts the 2020 race to a very different place than the 2016 race was. When you look also, the, the other thing I'll mention is that the race has also been pretty durable in, in the sense that Biden's lead, uh, which you know is anywhere between eight and nine points on average, if you look at the average now in national polling, and also you know, he retains a pretty good and, and, and noticeable advantage in many battleground states, that lead has been pretty durable. We haven't seen it bounce around nearly as much as we did in 2016. So, there are atmospherics, I think, that suggest that 2020 and 2016 are going to be pretty different races. You know, obviously the proof will be in the pudding on election day, but so far as you look at the race, you know, I, I think it's two pretty different races, actually. And, and any effort to, to really compare the two, I think, runs aground when you look at, at the reasons why these two races, that, again, at an atmospheric level, are, are really quite different. Um, you know, again, you know, we'll see in a few weeks. Uh, this is kind of where things stand with the Electoral College now. Um, you know, the, the vice president, Vice President Biden, starts with, uh, with a considerable advantage. In fact, he starts at this point as we look at things as of, as of this morning. 
Uh, and if you believe, again, the public polling as well as, uh, as the state polling, uh, what, what you see is that the vice president, uh, Vice President Biden, already has the number of electoral votes he'll need to win this election. Now, there are a number of states that are still, I think, within the margin that could flip, that are still quite competitive. Um, a few points I would make about this. First of all, the president has far fewer pathways to 270 electoral votes than, than Joe Biden does. Um, and you can see that here, essentially, the president cannot win this election without winning Florida. He cannot win this election, uh, I think, without winning Pennsylvania, uh, because that is going to be his best chance in the upper Midwest. And he's got to control North Carolina and Georgia, two states that he won uh, in, in 2016. Um, you know, there are a few states that, that I think, you know, represent interesting opportunities for Vice President Biden that really probably should not have represented opportunities several months ago, one of which is the state of Ohio, where President Trump has had a steady lead and that lead has diminished over the last several months. So uh, again, I think the more important thing here is not to focus on the specific number, but to think carefully about what the pathways to victory for President Trump and, and the Biden-Harris ticket are in the alternative. And I think there are many more opportunities for Biden-Harris than there are for Trump-Pence, again, if the public polling is to be believed. One thing I'll say about the polling is um, it's only as good as the assumptions we make about who will turn out on election day. Uh, and I think the challenge uh, that we all have is determining what that turnout will look like, given that we are voting in the midst of a pandemic. We have much more mail-in voting this year than ever before. And the Trump-Pence team would tell you, if they were here talking about their chances, that, um, that they are planning to change the nature of the electorate, particularly in the upper Midwest that they have access to millions of non-college educated white voters, which is a constituency the president has done very well with, that they have a bunch of those voters who did not vote in 2016, who they have registered and will vote for the first time in 2020, and that will change the complexion of the electorate and therefore change the outcome in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. Um, if that is the case, I, I, I do think the president stands a shot at winning you know, at least a few of those states. Uh, the question is whether you believe the theory of the case or not, whether you actually believe that that sort of alteration of the electorate is happening. Uh, and, and again, I think that's one of those things that we'll know a lot better on election day. But it's hard, hard to tell before that uh, if, if that theory about the changing nature of the, of the electorate is actually true. But, but as things stand today, Vice President Biden has a, a strong and durable lead one which, uh, which I think any general election candidate would be envious of at this stage uh, of the campaign. Um, let me just speak briefly at a macro level. I mean, we've seen four years of the Trump administration. I don't think anybody believes that things will be all that different in the second term in terms of how the administration operates. So let me just talk a little bit about what we would expect in a Biden administration. And then I wanna talk about the policy contrast between the two. Um, you know, look, I think COVID-19 is the overriding concern for the Biden-Harris ticket. I think in a Biden administration, he's likely going to have to spend his first 100 days in, in no small part dealing with the economic health care and education issues surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I think much of the dialogue, the policy dialogue during the campaign is focused on what they would do, whether it's a national mask mandate, thinking about how to, uh, to create fiscal stimulus, which is something that the two sides have not been able to agree on politically. Now, I think we, we have a sense that there's not going to be a stimulus package before the election. There won't be uh, anything to, to alter the fiscal trajectory in the very short run. I think that will then become a focus if Biden wins in the lame duck period, as well as during the, the first uh, several uh, months of his administration. Um, I think that it's likely that some of the issues that are not related to the pandemic, I've got antitrust on here, some of the, the big tech regulation issues that I know are very uh, vote in vogue now to talk about. I think those are on the back burner. Uh, look, I think the administration takes on a much more traditional view of how to deal with a regulatory process, how to deal with Congress. Um, the Trump administration has used executive action a lot, has used it at historic levels. Um, I, I would expect the Biden administration to try, at least at the outset, to work with Congress to the extent possible, but I don't rule out the possibility that they use a significant amount of executive action as well. Uh, whether in the form of, of executive orders or agency guidance or, or the formal administrative process. Um, uh, I think also that the composition of Congress matters a lot. And we'll have to see what happens. I didn't talk about the Senate races. Uh, I, I think the Senate map has also shifted a lot over the last several months. I think Democrats have a, a very strong opportunity 
to recapture the majority of the United States Senate, in which case, if they have a unified House and Senate, you can expect the pace of legislation, the pace of activity to pick up. Uh, on the other hand, if Republicans control the Senate, you're going to have split control of the Congress, and it's going to be a lot harder to get things through. Uh, but the you know, president's first 100 days, first 200 days is traditionally an opportunity to, to get some things done. And I think in this situation, we will, we will see much of the same. Uh, we'll see opportunities for a, a Biden administration to, to, to move, albeit at a slower pace and if there's unified control of Congress. Um, some of the key policy contracts, and, and let me just say in this part of the, of the conversation that the president's campaign has not been all that forthcoming about what a second term agenda would look like. That's not unusual necessarily. Uh, the Obama campaign in 2012 and the campaign I worked on for Mitt Romney wasn't particularly forthcoming about what a, a President Obama second term would look like. That having been said, I do think that we can we can intuit a little bit what Trump would do, particularly in these areas I have here, healthcare, economic policy, and energy issues. And there are some pretty stark contrasts that I think are worth talking about and worth thinking about as we move forward in this election cycle, as we think about uh, what this election cycle looks like, to the extent that there is a policy conversation, uh, I, I think that there will be some amount of contrast between the two in these specific areas. Um, let's begin with healthcare, which is an area I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, here, I think the two administrations would, would be starkly different. Um, the Biden administration will spend a lot of time thinking about how to uphold and expand the ACA. That could mean expanding the subsidy framework of the ACA. It could mean figuring out how to create additional inc incitements for states to, to expand uh, the Medicaid program, which is something that some states still have not done. Medicaid is the program targeted at lower income Americans, which has been responsible for the bulk of coverage gains from the Affordable Care Act. About 80% of the coverage gains have been effectuated through the expansion of Medicaid. I would fully expect a Biden administration to, to focus on that, as well as focusing on how to get more Americans into the, uh, to the state-based and federal marketplaces, which again, were a key component of the ACA. Um, I think you will see a Biden administration pursue something called the public option. This is something that uh, Vice President Biden in his uh, Democratic campaign platform has differentiated himself from other more progressive Democrats on. Uh, many of you may know that more progressive Democrats have called on Vice President Biden to support Medicare for all or a single payer system. Uh, the Vice President has resisted that. Uh, he has not uh, embraced that. He has instead said that he'd like to add a public plan that would compete with private plans uh, on, uh, on marketplaces throughout the country. That public health care option uh, would be similar in, uh, in, in structure to Medicare, although it would carry the essential health benefits that are part of the Affordable Care Act now. Uh, and, and it would, in the theory of the, of the vice president and his campaign, add competition to the marketplaces, uh, lowering costs and increasing opportunities for individuals to buy affordable health insurance. Um, you will see him act likely on something called surprise billing, which, uh, which is uh, a, a big political hot button issue, something that the president has talked about as well, but been frankly unable to move the ball forward on as much as I'm sure he would like. Uh, you will see the vice president probably move on drug pricing, which is an issue that uh, again, has great political salience. I fully expect him to be more aggressive in using the power of the federal government to engage in direct negotiation with drug prices, uh, with, with drug manufacturers. This is something that has been very controversial. Republicans have traditionally opposed it, although President Trump's actually expressed some sympathy for it. So there may be more overlap there between Republicans and Democrats than we think. And then finally, uh, I think actually both Trump and Biden are going to see how they can use the Department of Justice's antitrust enforcement authority to tackle market concentration problems, which we see in particular in, in, in the acute care space in many markets throughout America. There's really only one large hospital in some markets that tends to drive up prices and drive up healthcare costs for Americans. So I do expect him, whether it's in looking at horizontal consolidation or vertical consolidation in healthcare, I do expect the Biden administration to more aggressively go after those things. A uh, second Trump administration, uh, I think, takes a very different path in, in some ways. First of all, uh, much more aggressive in using administrative and executive action to limit the scope of the ACA, to limit implementation of the ACA. I don't expect the Trump administration to pursue repeal of the ACA as they did in 2017. I think they've discovered that was a political snafu. Uh, they may use the courts to limit how the ACA is, is uh, carried out. They may use other means, but I don't see them going to Congress and trying to, to do that. 
Um, I see them, for example, uh, trying to use a provision in the ACA that provides states with more flexibility. I see them trying to use that to encourage states to do more when it comes to enforcing uh, some of the ACA's requirements rather than concentrating power at the federal level. Um, I think you're going to see them expand efforts around price transparency and price uh, and, and quality transparency. That's been a big focus of executive action. I think that's an area where they might work with the Congress to effectuate some changes. Um, I see them trying to codify some of the, the things they've done in the first term with respect to competition in healthcare marketplaces. Um, I think, as I noted earlier, that they will move on trying to find consensus around drug pricing and surprise medical billing. Uh, and, and I don't see them making a lot of changes to Medicare, which is something the president promised when he first ran for president and has been a hallmark of his administration, basically saying that they're not going to touch Medicare. You know, I, I don't expect them to, to do that uh, in a second term either. I think they will, they will hold true to that promise, which I think is unfortunate given that, um, you know, Medicare is a program I think that fundamentally does need some changes. And going forward, it would have been an opportunity for a Republican administration to do that, but that's not something that they focus some time on. So there, there are significant contrasts here. There are significant differences. And I think those would be seen very, very soon and very quickly after the vice president uh, would take office if, 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 that, if he should win the election. Um, in economic policy, uh, the Biden team has been much more specific than the Trump team has. Um, I think the Biden administration, look, I think they will hike taxes, particularly for uh, higher earners. I think that's something their campaign has said they would do. They've talked about limiting or trying to hold harmless people who make less than $400,000. Uh, I think some of that, whether they can do that or not, depends on how you view, for example, the incidence of the corporate tax, which some economists believe falls broadly across the income distribution, an increase in the corporate tax, which the Biden team has called for. Uh, you know, could have effects on wages and things that, that, that clearly do impact people who make less than $400,000. But at least on paper, the Biden team has said they will not raise taxes of, for, for those making um, under $400,000. Uh, they've talked about uh, increasing capital gains tax rates. They've talked about increasing the corporate tax, as I noted earlier. Um, they will likely expand the child and dependent care credit, which has become a particular issue during the COVID-19 pandemic as parents have had to seek out different forms and alternative forms of childcare, given that, that many schools remain virtual. Uh, that is something that the Biden team is very much attuned to. Um, I think you're gonna see them prioritizing manufacturing in some ways by, by instituting tax credits that penalize, for example, offshoring of jobs. That's something that uh, politically has been very popular, particularly in the upper Midwest, but also something where, uh, where I think you'll find the vice president and his team spending some time if they're elected. Uh, and, and you will also see them, I think, push pretty aggressively for affordable housing initiatives. That includes expanding the availability of Section 8 housing, expanding the availability of vouchers under Section 8, and figuring out ways to incentivize more uh, housing stock, which has been an issue in, in many urban areas around the country, such as in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, as I noted, the Trump administration on economic policy has been much more muted, but I think you would expect the same kind of activity that you've seen during the first term, a focus on deregulation, a focus on tax relief. The president has been no, uh, has not made secret his affinity for um, cutting the payroll tax. I think that's something you certainly could see, particularly in a desire to, to boost the economy further. I think there could be focus on middle income tax relief on the income tax side. Um, I, I think you're gonna see the president continue to pursue a bilateral uh, trade orientation. You know, he has been pretty hostile toward multilateral trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, you will see him, I think, pursue bilateral trade deals with the United Kingdom. There's been some talk of pursuing one with Taiwan. I think those are very real possibilities in a second Trump term. Uh, I, I think you will see him focus on, again, on manufacturing because there is a political constituency there. I think you could see some effort to create tax credits around manufacturing. And then finally, the president's been a big fan of these opportunity zones that, he, that, that, his, that was a legislation that was passed as part of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017 and subsequently expanded in another piece of legislation after that, I would expect the administration to focus on how you expand uh, and create additional uh, opportunity zone legislation. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's up for debate kind of how effective these are, but obviously it, it is a way for him to promote tax relief uh, and to promote uh, development, particularly in areas where uh, where economic opportunity has not been as visible uh, over the last few decades. And I think that you're going to hear the administration really focus in on ways of expanding or continuing to expand that, uh, that opportunity zone program. 
Uh, finally, on, on energy and climate change policy, you know, you probably could not find two visions that are more different. Um, and, and we don't need to belabor the point too much. I think the Trump administration's view is continuing to deregulate, continuing to figure out how to use all the tools at the president's disposal with respect to executive authority to, um, uh, to create opportunities for domestic energy production. That is something that you have heard uh, over and over again. I think you will see them disengage from international fora where climate change is a topic. I think you've seen that in the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accords. I think the, the Biden team would go in precisely the opposite direction. Um, the president's team has talked about increasing infrastructure spending. I think that's something that they're interested in doing. Um, you know, now whether they'll be able to, to do that in the way they want to, which is really a more tax credit based approach than a direct spending approach, uh, we'll have to see. You know, one of the big jokes of the first term of President Trump's time in office was that every week is infrastructure week. And they always like talking about infrastructure policy, whether they're actually able to move the ball forward on that or, or, or not remains to be seen. The Biden administration, obviously, I think you're going to see them in state reinstating um, some of the action around pollution limits, fuel standards. Uh, uh, fe protection of federal lands. I think that's something that you will see. Uh, again, much of that is administrative in nature. It's not, uh, it's not legislative, so it wouldn't be codified necessarily, but it would be administrative action. I think you're going to see them invest a lot in clean energy and innovation. That's really one of the core uh, hallmarks of the Biden energy policy. Uh, I think they'll spend a lot of time thinking about that. And as I noted earlier, I think, I think they go back at Paris and, and, and try to take one more, one more crack at it. But obviously, there'll be much more focus on climate policy in a Biden administration than you would see in a second Trump administration. That, I think that goes without saying. Um, and let me conclude with sort of two slides and, and, and a set of uh, admonitions about all of this. Um, look, neither plan is going to be cheap. This is an analysis that was performed by this, the Committee on a Responsible Federal Budget that actually came out yesterday that looked at the cost of the two plans. And, and both plans' net of tax increases are, are still relatively costly. Um, the, the, the Trump proposals, at least what, what the CRFB can make of them, would add about $5 trillion to the deficit over the next 10 years. The Biden plan adds about five and a half, six trillion, uh, and that's in the sort of moderate scenario. You can look at a lower cost or higher cost scenario, but you get the picture here. There's going to be a lot of fiscal spending, there's going to be a lot of fiscal expansion over the next couple of years. It's not in vogue to talk about fiscal responsibility. Voters haven't expressed a high level of concern for it. I think it's something that, that both sides are not particularly attuned to. And the result of that spending in the long run is, is a significant increase in deficit and, and, and debt exposure. Um, you know, This would generally be something that Republicans would want to spend some time talking and thinking about. Um, the president is a self-proclaimed king of debt. He does not have a particular problem with, uh, with a high debt load. I think in his view, debt's a relatively good thing, actually. And I would not leave it to progressives or Democrats to argue to the contrary. And so I think the result is we're going to see large fiscal expansion rather than contraction over the next few years. I think some of that's necessary for the economy to, to, to continue its COVID-19 recovery. But as you can see over the long run, the housing and energy and healthcare plans uh, for the Biden team do end up raising some serious concerns about, about debt and deficit. And in the same way, some of President Trump's proposals would also do the same. Uh, and so I think regardless of who gets elected, the next 10 years are not going to be an exercise or a study in fiscal responsibility. Uh, and, and I think that's an important point to, to, to note as well. But obviously, you know, this election is going to be about contrasts. As we move into the last 20 some odd days, I think those contrasts will get sharper. Uh, I think there's no reason to believe that the two sides are going to get any less nasty or any less, uh, uh, less engaging in terms of trying to get at one another and what each side would do. Uh, and, and so, you know, buckle up. We'll see what happens. And uh, and with that, Dee, why don't I come back to you? And happy to uh, take any questions that may have arisen during uh, during this time. All right, thank you, Lanny. He, I think it's a useful reminder amidst um, how the election has proceeded so far that there are actual policy differences between the two candidates, and that a lot of the sort of pocketbook issues that typically dominate elections will still be important and relevant after November 2020. Um, so the first question is from Frank Fukuyama, the director of CDDRL, who's asking, you know, Lan, you're talking about policy differences as if this were a normal Republican administration, but it seems that the most important characteristic of this administration has been President Trump's erosion of institutions across the board. Is there any reason to think this wouldn't get much worse in a second term? And is that much more important than his policy agenda? 
Um, I think the erosion of institutions is noteworthy. I think it's important. Uh, I, I would say this. I think there are two views about what a, what a Trump second term would look like in that regard. Uh, I think there's a dominant view and then there's a, there, there's a sort of contrarian view. The dominant view is, you know, there's no reason to expect a, you know, 70 some odd year old person to change his behavior. Uh, that, you know, that he is who we thought he was and he is going to be who we've seen him to be. Uh, and, and every reason to believe that certainly some of the institutions that we value uh, and, and that we trust and that we care about would, would continue to, to be um, vulnerable over the next several years. The contrarian view is that, you know, as the president thinks about his own legacy and thinks about how he wants to be remembered, that somehow he curbs his behavior and that that is the, that is the single uh, thing that could potentially change his behavior, not really anything else has worked. Uh, you know, it's, it's a contrarian view. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's one that I that I particularly agree with, but it is out there. You know, there is this notion that that potentially he, um, you know, he could change his his tune and he could change his attitude toward these things. Uh, in, in terms of the institution versus policy thing, you know, I would push back a little bit in the notion that you know, policy is extremely important. Um, the course our country takes over the next co couple of years is, is, is very, very important. And, and some of that institutional element has an impact on public policy making. But I think it is, we do ourselves a disservice if we don't spend time thinking about what these different visions of the next several years look like and giving voters an opportunity to decide based on what those visions of the next several years look like. Uh, and, and I know it's not popular, I know it's not in vogue, but there are very real distinctions and very real differences. And, and I think there are some voters, I'll just say this, I think there's some voters who are undecided at this point, precisely for this reason. They see that President Trump has done things to erode our institutions. They don't like that. They don't like the tweeting. They don't like the attitude. They don't like the, the disregard for public health and safety that they've seen during this COVID-19 pandemic and during the president's recent diagnosis. But they also don't like where Vice President Biden and Senator Harris would take the country, and they're uncomfortable with that. And that's what they're weighing, right? They're weighing this very real concern about the president and who he is against the policy reality of what the next four years will look like. And I think that's why they're having a tough time. And the question is, will they return, will they sort of come home, so to speak, to the Trump-Pence ticket because that policy differences are so stark or will the institutional erosion and will all these issues, Frank, that you've alluded to, will all those issues sort of say, you know what, even if the next four years take us in a direction I personally don't agree with, it's worth it to save those institutions or to bolster those institutions. I think that will be the critical question for the voters who remain undecided. Look, nobody is confused about how they feel about Donald Trump. If you don't have an opinion of Donald Trump by now, you're on a hallucinogen of some kind because you, you know how you feel about Donald Trump. And if you're still undecided, you're undecided precisely because you're weighing, I think, this issue in your mind. So, you know, we'll see where it goes and, and how these voters end up, end up behaving. Uh, but the number of voters who are undecided at this point is exceedingly small, I think. And to the extent they are undecided, I do think it is, it is this struggle between, um, between the image and the, the reality of what they've seen with Donald Trump and, and the policy debate that we still are very much having. Okay, so just to think then a little bit more about the future of the Republican Party absent Trump, right? There's going to be a party, even when Trump either loses in November or exceeds his term limits. So Trump has done a lot to erode election integrity, for example, by decrying the, the nature of our elections, the procedures and their fairness. He's talked a lot about voter fraud. He said that uh, even though Russian election interference is not that important to him, that he may he still denies whether or not he'll sort of peacefully leave office in January. Um, and there's really been, ever since 2012, in the Republican autopsy, sort of factions within your party battling for the soul of the party. So what do you think is the long-term future of the Republican party, given that Trump has sown so much sort of distrust in these institutions, um, what happens next? Well, the, the Republican Party, I mean, you, you, you kind of alluded to this. After the Republican Party lost in 2012, after, after Mitt Romney lost, uh, the party sort of did this autopsy and said, look, what are, what are the things we can do to become more effective as a party and as a conservative movement? And, and the answer in the autopsy was overwhelming, which is you have to become a more open, welcoming, opportunity-based, diverse, coalition. 
Um, and, you know, I think that message was heard for about 18 months. And then we entered an election cycle and we got, you know, what we got. And, and a lot of that message was thrown out the window instead of trying to create a more diverse, younger, sort of more uh, a broad coalition, we ended up with essentially a, a, a coalition of, um, of, you know, some people who were dispositionally conservative with, with grievance politics and, and a whole host of other things that, that, that I think have been unwelcome influences within the Republican Party. So what does that mean? You know, I think a lot of this depends on what happens with, with President Trump. If he gets reelected, the Republican Party, you know, I think continues to be made in his image. And I think in a lot of ways that will mean that the dialogue we saw post 2012 goes completely out the window. Um, and I think it does continue to be a party that's built fundamentally on, uh, on a working class, white, uh, less educated base. And then from that, you know, you're gonna pick up some other additional pieces maybe, but that is fundamentally what the party will be about. And then, you know, you have an alternative vision of, of the party, which is closer to what the autopsy vision was. And I think that vision will have some, some purchase if the president loses. I think if the president loses, there is going to be a pretty uh, significant battle. You're going to have the group of people who was always in opposition to the president, but who think of themselves still as conservatives. Um, you know, I think that group will, will try to have some influence. I think you'll have some who were skeptical of the president, but did not leave the party, who will try and rebuild it from within. And then you'll have some who were sympathetic to the president, who will want to continue the, the president's vision, as it were, the populist, proto-nationalist uh, kind of vision for the party. And I think that will have some voice as well. And then there are also these ideological, beyond ideological, there are these uh, policy differences within the party as well, right? There's a group of Republicans that are saying, well, not so fast, you know, when it comes to the market-based orientation of the party. They would prefer a Republican party that is a little more status, Mm -hmm. that has a little bit more sympathy to the regulatory state, uh, that is not as reliant on a simply sort of let the market work orientation. I, I think there'll be that battle. I think there'll be a battle in, in national security policy between what the president has effectuated. Uh, if you want to put an intellectual kind of framework around it, I, I think it's tough. You know, I mean, his, his advocates say it's America first. You know, I'm not so sure that that makes a lot of sense. But anyway, there'll be a intellectual conversation about what Trump advocated versus a more traditional uh, engagement view that you've seen espoused by past Republican presidents. So th there is going to be a multi-dimensional battle over what the Republican Party looks like. Where it comes out, Didi, I don't know. I, 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 if I knew, you know, I, I would be doing something else, but, but I don't know, you know, and I think um, you know, I hope to participate in that conversation. I think it's something that, that I truly value. I think America needs two strong political parties. Yeah. I think it needs a strong conservative movement, one that actually stands for something uh, beyond just a, a bunch of political slogans. So I'm hopeful that that reconstruction gets to happen, but you know, we'll have to see. Okay, so we have a question from one of our postdocs, Salma Musa, asking if, going back to this question of who's undecided, do you think Trump has gained any substantial numbers of new voters under his presidency? Has he mobilized some new base? Are there going to be people who vote for him in 2020 who didn't vote in 2016 or who voted against him? Um, I do think that, that there is some possibility that there are a number of Americans who did not vote at all in 2016 who will vote for him. And that's that phenomenon I was discussing earlier where you might have some uh, less edu less well-educated, uh, white, working class, middle sort of industrial Midwestern voters who, who you know, I think still fundamentally agree with, with where the president's headed. Um, and, and I think, you know, in that sense, you could have those folks who come in and change the, the dynamic of the electorate a little bit in that part of the country. Um, with respect to whether I think there's any voters who did not vote for him in 2016 and voted for Hillary Clinton, who will vote for him now, that I'm more skeptical of. Um, I don't know that there are a lot of those voters out there. Um, I would say, you know, again, the bulk of the voters who remain undecided are undecided because they're torn about what element of Trump they, they, they believe will be the predominant Trump going forward. In other words, is it going to be the, the tweeting you know, kind of element, or is it going to be the policy element? And I think that 
that's what leaves them undecided. And I'll say this, for example, you know, there's been some conversation about how the uh, nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to be the next Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court will affect the election. And, and in my view, uh, if Republicans were talking about it, I think that it could actually work to their advantage in this sense. It's a reminder to those voters who are uncomfortable with the president that there are reasons to vote for Republicans still, that they want a justice who is dispositionally more conservative, who is a constitutionalist, who believes in the rule of law, et cetera. They want that. They don't necessarily want Trump, but you can't get one without the other. So they vote for Trump because they have that comfort around, around that issue. I mean, I, 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 that's the, the, the prototypical dynamic that I'm talking about, where you've got a voter who's undecided, but on balance thinks, you know, I, I care about the, where the country goes from a policy perspective more than the potential damage that four more years of President Trump could do to institutions, for example, and therefore I pull the lever for him. Okay, so one of the president's more controversial um, sort of trends or one of the trends under his presidency has been the resurrection of white supremacy as a force in American politics. You talked about Black Lives Matter in, in your slides and of course your former boss Mitt Romney marched in a Black Lives Matter protest um, in June. And we know that there are some GOP leaders who have been very reluctant to denounce it. At times have seemed like they're embracing it, including the president. So when you say that some voters face this trade-off, including many Republicans, between policy outcomes that they want and, and other things that they don't want, you know, how does a party or a voter choose between these things? And how, to what extent you know, well, can the Republican base force the president or force the party to try to remove extremist elements? Well, what, what, one of the things that's become exceedingly clear is that there is no independent mechanism for Republicans not named Donald Trump to effectuate any change in Donald Trump's behavior. I mean, he, 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 he does what he's going to do. Um, I would suggest this. If a voter believes uh, strongly in the need for, uh, for the president to denounce more directly, more clearly, and more forcefully white supremacy, uh, that they probably aren't going to be supporting the president. Uh, that's I, I I don't I don't see the I, I don't see how you square that circle. In other words, I think if you um, if you have a tremendous amount of discomfort over over what he's done there on that particular dynamic, um, I, I I just don't see it because you know the debate. So the debate was was many things. It was not many things last week. Um, but I will say this: I do think it clarified for people. Um, you know, who care about this issue to the extent that they had any confusion going into the debate, it clarified kind of where things stand. Um, and, you know, the fact that more Republicans weren't able to stand up and simply denounce both how the president addressed it, but more broadly, the, the, the support for white supremacy, I think is shameful. Uh, and, you know, if it's an issue you care about, you're going to vote accordingly. All right. Um, so another question about policy, but about immigration policy. Mm. Should we expect a complete and immediate reversal of Trump era immigration policies like the travel ban, the Muslim ban and border separations um, under the Biden administration? Or do you think there would be any any change in these policies under a second Trump term as well? Um, immigration is one of the hallmark issues for, for President Trump. It has been since day one. Uh, I would not expect any any change. You know, I think at, at base, what the Trump administration wants is a, is a, is a more merit-based system. So in that sense, I think they would try to move in Congress toward that direction. Yeah. But with respect to some of the executive action, whether around uh, family separation, uh, border detention, uh, issues around uh, travel bans, I, I expect that those would likely continue uh, posture-wise in a second Trump administration. Uh, I think the Biden administration will take a very different course. I think to the extent that they can reverse on executive action, they will. They will reverse uh, quite quickly, some of those executive actions that are most controversial. Um, it's a separate question whether they actually pursue comprehensive immigration reform in the Congress. That, that has proven to be a very challenging political issue. And while the Biden uh, campaign is on record supporting comprehensive immigration reform, there is an intra-party battle on the Democratic side regarding how progressive to go there. Uh, up to and including some who seek to decriminalize unauthorized border crossings, right? I mean, I think that's a that, that was a touchstone issue during the primary campaign that divided the progressive left from the more moderate left. And, and I don't think Biden wants to go there. I think it divides the Democratic Party. Uh, I think he sticks to more conventional immigration policies. 
and or just doesn't touch the issue from a legislative perspective because you know he perceives it as taking energy from other initiatives where there might be more uh, more success at you know unifying the democratic coalition. But but on executive action, yes, I, I do fully expect that he would he would quite immediately uh, overturn uh, some of the more challenging elements of uh, uh, of the president's policies in that in that regard. Okay. Um, so I have a question about political reform as part of the political agenda for both the Democratic and, and Republican parties. We know that in 2018, when the House, um, when Democrats retook the House, the first bill they introduced was HR1, which was a bill that included many different types of reforms to campaign finance, gerrymandering, um, how we vote, election administration. Do you think that there's any likelihood that um, this becomes a bipartisan issue moving forward, reforming either some of our institutions or reforming, say, elements of the civil service, some of the institutions that have been eroded under Trump, or even judicial reform? Um, yeah, you know, the judicial reform piece is interesting, and, and there we've gotten into the extremes, right? There's the conversation about court packing on the one side, and then there's a conversation on another about you know, are there ways, for example, we can restrain life tenure? I've heard more conversation right. around eliminating Article Three life tenure than, than at any point, you know, certainly that, that as long as I've been following it. Um, I, I, I don't know that judicial reform is in the cards. I said, unless, unless Biden and, and his team really want to push the court packing idea, which I would advise them against, I think politically it's a very challenging thing to do. And the pre vice president himself has said he's not interested in doing it. So, right. uh, but the conversation keeps, keeps, keeps going on. Um, I think that uh, on, on sort of uh, voting reform issues around trying to create more security and certainty uh, on, on, on the mail-in voting process, you know, it's possible we could see some bipartisan consensus. The, the challenge is that a lot of that is state control. Obviously, the states have the opportunity to control the time, place, and manner of elections, so, so much more of it ends up being state-level issues. But the, but the federal level can set the tone. It can obviously provide the right amount of funding that's necessary. It can, it can uh, ensure that we're doing all we can to, to secure the vote against foreign threats and foreign intervention. That's something I think we certainly should be spending more time doing. Uh, and I think there is a bipartisan consensus around that. So, so yeah, I, I, you know, I think there are some things you could see bipartisan consensus on, but I don't think more broadly, there's gonna be a huge appetite to do anything on campaign finance. I don't think, I don't think judicial reform is a, is a big issue. So I think in limited spots, yes, but but there may be other issues where where there's going to be more interest, at, at least in that first uh, 100 to 200 day period. OK, um, and finally, I know you said it wasn't in your slides, but do you have any thoughts or speculation about Congress and the House and the Senate? Um, I know that you've worked on the senatorial committee for the Republican Party. Yeah. Where do you think those elections stand and what are going to be the critical issues shaping them as we head towards November? So um, the House is, is done. The House will be controlled by the Democrats. There, there's no way I see the Republicans re reclaiming the House. Uh, there are a few interesting congressional races you know, that, that are worth keeping an eye on, particularly those in suburban areas where the Republican Party was blown out in 2018. The question is, can they recapture some of those suburbs? You know, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical given kind of where the dialogue has been the last couple of weeks, but you know, we'll see. Um, the Senate side is really going to come down to, to a few races. It's going to come down to uh, the race in Iowa between incumbent Senator Joni Ernst uh, and Ms. Greenfield. Uh, that'll be an interesting uh, uh, last few days. They just had a debate the other day. It's going to be very close, I think, down to the wire. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens in North Carolina. Incumbent Republican Senator Tom Tillis is running against Cal Cunningham. Uh, there, I think Tillis has gained an advantage the last couple of days because Cunningham's had a, had a few... Um, let's just call them issues that he's been dealing with. If you don't know what they are, Google Cal Cunningham and you'll figure it out. Um, there have been some issues there that I think work to Tillis's advantage. Uh, there's an interesting couple races in Colorado and Arizona that I think would be very challenging for Republicans to hang on to seats there. Um, I think there's a Senate race in South Carolina that's become interesting in the last couple of weeks. That's between Lindsey Graham, who will be front and center at the hearings next week when the Senate Judiciary Committee considers the nomination of, uh, of Judge Barrett and he's running against a, a very talented candidate in Jamie Harrison, that is a real race uh, and a real possibility for the Democrats. And then you have, uh, George, you have two races in Georgia, but, but the more interesting one, there is a special election, which uh, is currently still undecided as between the Republicans. There's Kelly Loeffler, who was the incumbent, who was nominated to be the senator running against Doug Collins, who's a true died in the wool Trump uh, Republican. Once they resolve things, that will go to a runoff. And, and so we may not know about control of the Senate until December, uh, until that special election has happened. So 
uh, the, the, the Senate is, is truly at the knife's edge right now. Uh, if you force me to, to, to choose, I would say, you know, Democrats have a slightly better than 50% chance of, of claiming the majority in the Senate, but it's very close. And the dynamic down, down the stretch is gonna hinge on any number of different issues, including how the president performs on election day. I think if the president performs well, the president's outperforming a number of these Senate candidates, by the way. He's outperforming mm -hmm. Martha McSally in Arizona. He's outperforming Tom Tillis in North Carolina. If the president, if, if the president performs up to where we think he will in those states, that will boost those Republican candidates and create a higher likelihood there'll be a Republican Senate. But um, you know, this will be a lot of, uh, a lot of interest and, and a lot of uh, back and forth over these next 20 some odd days. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lanhe, for joining us today for that very informative discussion. And it's going to be a, a long few weeks. Do you have any guesses as to how long we'll have to wait before we have an election result? Uh, you know, I've just told people that uh, it's a it's a feature, not a bug, if we have to wait. And, and, and we right. want the count to be conducted thoroughly and securely and well. It's a, it's a message I've been delivering uh, to, to media. It's a message I've been delivering in my own media that, that it's important for for us to be patient. And there will be a temptation to try and, and, and create uncertainty, I think, if, if, the, if, for example, we don't have a result on election day. Uh, and, and that will be very damaging to our democracy. Uh, and, and so one of the things I think we need to be ready for is an election that's not decided on election night or even the day after. That having been said, if current electoral models hold, we'll probably know on election night. And Vice President Biden will have, will have probably secured a relatively significant win if the polling is to be believed, if the trend continues. So, you know, in some ways, having a certain result is, is nice. I, I think it, it obviates a lot of these conversations, but I think the greater likelihood is we are gonna be waiting on Pennsylvania. We are gonna be waiting on, uh, on Florida. We are probably gonna be waiting on, on Arizona and a few other states that are critical. And, and that's a, a feature of the system we have. That's true. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lanhe. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. We hope that you're all safe wherever you are. And we'll see you hopefully next week at 1130, same time, same place. Thanks, Lanhe. Thank you. Bye.